In this video, Neville Goddard will discuss a topic that confuses almost all of us. It's about belief. So what is a belief? I and others often use the words believe and beliefs, and I realized how confusing they are and how meaningless they can be practically speaking. When you read belief, you often think of something solid, fixed in your subconscious. It appears to be a solid thing, or even some kind of entity, you need to change with some great effort, alpha, sleepy states, sats, etc. It makes you feel like you have to go very deep in the subconscious and try your best to impress it with what you desire. It all appears as if you had to ask someone's permission to create a new belief. Be glad that those confusions end at this moment because a belief is a thought you keep dwelling on, which generates feelings, moods, choices, desires, and behaviors that make sense from that belief standpoint. A belief is a thought you keep focusing on. A belief is your decision in this present moment. It is how you decide to think and feel now. It is where you focus your attention now. It is under your control now. All of those are part of the conscious mind. Whether the subconscious is important or not, whether you should impress it or not is quite irrelevant because you can only direct and deal with the conscious mind. What happens behind the scenes, so to speak, is none of your business. And all of that happens in the now. So again, you are always dealing with the thought and the feeling of the present moment. Now, let's hear Neville Goddard Ann's opinion about this topic. Make sure you listen carefully. Enjoy. So what do I mean by our real beliefs? Our real beliefs are what we live by. Real belief and knowing are one. When a man really believes, it's just as though he knows it. It's tantamount to knowing. So when I tell you belief, I call it faith, I call it belief, it is not complete till it becomes experience. One must experience it, and then they know it. Now, you will hear the same thing tonight. Everyone present will hear exactly the same thing. But no two will hear it in the same depth. Some will hear it on the surface. Others will hear it below the surface. And others will hear it down in the very depths of their being. It's where you hear it. As we are told, the word came to them as it did to us. But it did not profit them, because it was not mixed with faith in those who heard it. They heard it and rejected it, but they heard it. It came in and went out. It did not receive acceptance by those who heard it. And so they instantly rejected it. Tonight, I hope you will not reject what I'm here to tell you. But that's your choice. You're free. You could accept it or reject it. But I tell you, if I get through tonight and you apply it, because you are the operant power, I can tell you that it doesn't operate itself. If this very moment I asked you to think of a friend, just think of a friend, and now hear him tell you something lovely, something lovely about himself, about a mutual friend, or about you. Just hear it. Do you believe that that actually took place? You may say, well, I imagined it, but it didn't really take place. I will tell you the day will come, and I hope now, that when you imagine a state, before you have external confirmation of that state, to you, it is as though you heard it externally. You know it. That this internal act is equal to the external confirmation of that act. You get to that point. Because the difference between God and man is measured only in terms of this imaginative power. If I would now speak of the power that is God, as we are told in scripture, it's revealed constantly as power, sheer power. Third chapter, fourth, fifth, and sixth verses of the book of Exodus. Sheer power. Moses stands in the presence of power, but it's creative power. And the distance between God and man is measured by simply power. On this level, if I'm on the surface of my being, only this is real, and what my senses allow. But if I go deeper into my own being, 
moving ever towards the core of my being, who is God, then my imaginative act becomes externalized. Quickly externalized as I go deeper and deeper. On the surface, it seems to take an interval of time, if I believe. If I don't believe, it never comes into some external form at all, never. Yet I'm living in a world, not understanding it, not knowing what it's all about. So really the story that I want to tell you is trying to ask you and plead with you to buy your religion wholesale. Go to the maker. Go to the source. Don't buy it retail. There's some man in between. No one in between you and the source. You go right into the depth and buy your, whole, your religion wholesale by going to the source, which is your own wonderful human imagination, your own I amness. That's God. The story we told you last Tuesday of one whose name was Eddie. Eddie had the identical experience of the one recorded in the book of Exodus. When he heard, do not come up here, read the words. The words are, do not come here. Read it in the book of Exodus. Four, fifth, and six verses of the third chapter of Exodus. And the Lord said unto Moses, Do not come here. And then Moses hid his face, not in shame, but in fear. He was afraid to look at God. So Eddie saw the symbol of God, and he ran. He was scared too. The identical story. And what did he hear? The revelation of God's name, I am. He first heard it, I am. No one in sight. Then it repeated itself so loudly he thought it came from above. He looked up thinking of some machine, maybe some helicopter, with a PS system is broadcasting the name I am. There was not a thing in sight. And then the third, don't come up here. Being curious, he did go up there to the hill to confront a rattlesnake. Fortunately, it was not called a spring. It was simply a four-foot-long snake all stretched out, the symbol of the creative power of God. But it scared him. It scares man. The man actually sees what really is in himself, that he's solely responsible for everything that is taking place in his world solely responsible. It's scares him. It's too much until he goes deeper and deeper and hears the same word of truth, but hears it in depth. And then he assumes full responsibility for all that is taking place within him. So tonight, let me share with you a few stories. Seven years ago, a lady, she's not here tonight, she's now on a new job and is taken away for a while. But when she heard it, that imagining creates reality, she said to herself, well, if that is so, I would like to go to Egypt. She had no money. She's never been a lady of means, always working, small sums of money, could never accumulate what it would take to make the trip. And so the usual story, she told her dream. She didn't keep it to herself. She told it. Nothing wrong in it. If you really believe it, you can tell it. As you're told in the scripture, go. Tell no man. But show John. Show the world. But that's, if you don't tell man before, will man believe you after the event? He may question your honesty. But if you tell him before the event, then he is assured because actually you have a witness to the fact you did tell him before the event. So that is also in scripture. And now I will tell you before it takes place that when it does take place, you may believe. For that is courage in the depth of the soul, where one knows the imaginal act is a fact at the very moment of the act, though not yet seen by the outer man. But not everyone has that courage and that faith in the imaginal act. So she told it. And naturally her friends criticized them. It is stupid to go to that man, you waste your money. It's not religion. What is it? 
He is telling you that an assumption, though false, if persisted in, will harden into fact. Well, that's stupid. It doesn't make sense. 